All right, man. We live. All right, peace, peace to the people. Ain't nobody even in here yet. But uh, let me share the show, actually, well, how they come in. Y'all a little second. ETM Hotel, Brendan Sean, welcome in peace. My name is Sean. We got uh, Brothers of Tech. Be going in live in just a few. Uh, while you coming in, man, please like the show, share the show. Tell a friend, tell a friend that we live, man. And uh, let's get it in. So uh, we're just sharing the show right now. In the meantime, uh, you see the title to the show, we're going to get it in. So, um, that's all I got for right now, man. Tech, you yep. got anything you want to see? I go ahead. No, nah, no, nah, I'm good. Go ahead. Yeah, man, I'm just saying peace to the people as y'all come in. Uh, like Sean said, man, like the show and share the show. We're going to get into uh, Weeda, the kingdom of Weeda. I know uh, a lot of people have probably heard this claim. Uh, Weeda is Judah. And uh, that they was the Hebrew Israelite kingdom and so on. But most of it is based on this one map. But uh, we don't get into that map. We don't get into who made that map, why it's made and say what it say. And we gonna get into uh, the life inside the kingdom, how they live, day-to-day uh, -to -day basis, uh, what they did, we all know that there was a slave trading kingdom. We gonna um, we gonna dig into that too. We gonna dig into a little bit of everything. So hopefully, uh, I put forth something that y'all can uh, take home. Something something new that you ain't never heard of today. That's my goal. So uh, yeah, let me. Uh, Should have shown one more group. And I'll be ready for y'all. Okay. All right, we can get started. Uh, I'm pretty sure more people will come in as we get going. This is Life inside the kingdom of Weda. Was Weda a Hebrew Israelite kingdom? Was Weda the kingdom of Judah, the biblical kingdom of Judah? So let's start. And we are uh, on the, as you see on the on the right hand side, we got a um, a picture, an image of a person from Judah. This is how uh, they were depicted. We will uh, get into how they dress, what colors were royal. We gonna get into all that, man. So without further ado, let's get into it. My introduction is with the steady rise of black, with the steady rise in the black Hebrew Israelite cults that make the claim that blacks AKA African-Americans, I'm speaking specifically 
about African Americans are Israelites, primarily from the tribe of Judah, comes the revision of history to substantiate their pseudo historical assertions. One of the most popular of these hypotheses is that the kingdom of Weda in West Africa was that of an Israelite, was that of the Israelites that scattered from their native homeland in Southwest Asia by using an European map from the mid 18th century, they attempt to make this false connection while ignoring all other historical contexts. I will attempt to show that this is the mistake of Asiatic romanticism and an extreme case of confirmation bias by using primary, contemporary, and academic secondary literature while showing the true culture. So, this is what I plan to do. Hold on, y'all. Give me one second. Okay. I'm going to see if this video play. This is the claim. Now, you hear him. He said on the west coast of Africa on this map. Now nah, we couldn't hear. We couldn't hear. Oh, yeah. Y'all didn't hear it? Uh-uh. Oh. Oh, okay. Well, let me just explain. Tuzariak is claiming that Weta is Judah from this map on the west coast of Africa. He's claiming that <clears throat> Weta is Judah because of the spelling. And better yet, let me get to the next slide and uh, I'll just show you. This is the map. I don't know if I got a delay. Okay, this is the map. As you see in red, it says the kingdom of Judah or Weda, slave coast. And you, you see they uh, emphasize Judah on the top and on the bottom. So this is where he's getting his claim from. And again, his claim is that this, this kingdom, it says Judah, J-U-D-A, or Weda where it says slave coast is a Hebrew Israelite kingdom. He says that's them. And that's how he got here to America, which, you know, of course don't make no sense just off the top, but let's move on. We're gonna deal with a little bit of the history first. Weda is situated on the coastal area of the modern Republic of Benin in West Africa. In origin, it is an indigenous African town which has existed long before the French colonial occupation in 1892. In its pre-colonial period, it belonged to two African states. First, the kingdom of Hueda or Wida, and from 1727, that of Dahomey. So, First, it was his own kingdom, Hueda, or Weda. And then it got taken over in 1727 by Dahomey, and it was integrated into the Dahomeyan kingdom. First, the first inhabitants of the kingdom today remains the Fon. 
today remains the fond. That means those people that was there in the time of this kingdom are still there. The first inhabitants of the kingdom today remain fond with French inherited from, colony, from colonization superimposed as the official language of education and administration. In the pre-colonial period, WIDA served as the major outlet for the exportation of slaves for the transatlantic slave trade. So they were slave traders. Most of us already knew this. For anybody who didn't, they were slave traders, major slave traders. So you already got a strike. You broke up. I broke up. Can you hear me now? You were sounding good on my end, Tech. I don't know how the audience is. I'll look and see. Does everything sound good out in the audience? Yeah, Hold let on. me know how yeah, it sounds. Yeah, 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 you good, you good. Okay. So yeah, as I was saying though, th this was a major player, one of the one of the most, if not the most major player in the slave trade. Um, so you already got a strike against you by saying that these people sold you. I wish I could have heard the video. This is what he said. These people in the kingdom of Weta sold him, but he is the kingdom of Weta. Like it's kind of, it kind of makes no sense whatsoever. Weta was the slave traders, but he's saying that he was the one, they were the ones being traded. So how can Weta be the slave traders and the people that's being traded? Like it, it just really makes no sense, but let's keep going. In the pre-colonial period, WIDA served as a major outlet for the exportation of slaves for the transatlantic slave trade. The section of the African coast in which WIDA kingdom was situated was known to Europeans as the slave coast. So that's how many slaves was getting sold that Europeans called it the slave coast. All right, according to fond oral tradition, the Aja settlers that established themselves at present day Alada arrived in Southern Benin around the 12th or 13th century, coming from Tado on the Mano River. The Alada kingdom was the neighbor of the Oyo kingdom to whom they were a vassal and paid tribute. Before the 17th century, the Aja people populated the region of Wida and its inland predecessors, Alada. In the 1650s, Wida started breaking away from Alada and establishing itself as an independent and powerful polity of warriors, slavers, and traders. In 1671, the French moved their trading factory from Alada to Wida and the English and Portuguese were soon to follow. So first, the Europeans were primarily doing trade on the slave coast with a lot of, then uh, first, the French took the first step to move to Weda in 1671. And like I, like I said, soon after, the English and the Portuguese follow suit and came to Weta to do business too. All right, in local tradition, King Kapase is supposed to have founded the town, probably towards the end of the 16th century. The capital of this kingdom was Savi, which, which was situated about seven miles from the seaside. In this town, the king allowed Europeans convenient houses for their factories. The king protected Europeans, allowed them to do their business and leave safely. In 1702, the Aquamu, an expanding powerful pre-Ashanti kingdom, a Khan subgroup, conquered the, conquered the kingdom of Wida and had influence on the kingdom for a quarter of a century. Wida fell 
as a kingdom in 1727 and the conquest of King Agaja of Dahomey, wherein the king and his royal and his royal court fled and ran in fright to a nearby island rather than fight. So in 1727, King Agaja of Dahomey rolled up on uh, the king of Weta. And instead of fighting, basically they ran. They took off and fled to a nearby island. They didn't, they didn't want no smoke. Weta then became assimilated as part of the Dahomey kingdom. So let's talk a little bit about life inside of Weta, the customs and uh, the things that they did, uh, how the country looked, what it was known for. In most general terms, Weta was considered a middleman community not only for exchange and commodity, but also intermediary in the transmission of cultural influences. It was said that slaves were so plentiful in the interior of Africa that two were sometimes sold for a handful of salt and wheat. These prisoners of war came from inland countries where there were markets for men as there were in Europe for beasts. When a cargo of them arrived at Weta, they were conducted to prison, from whence they were drawn out into a large open plain where they were stripped and examined by European surgeons. Their mouth and teeth were inspected to tell their age, and they were made to jump and stretch their arms to show that they were healthy. All above 35 years of age, sickly, maimed, or blemished, if only by loss of a tooth was set aside. So they only wanted A plus, A plus plus. The, the young and healthy were paid for in calories and goods. The women being one fourth or one fifth less than the men. So again, you see the calories being used as currency. Uh, me and Kofi had a presentation. Um, on Kofi Pasa TV called Cowrie Shells in Africa. You can check that out. We can talk about that, um, West Africa and a lot of other places in Africa, Cowrie Shells being used as currency. And you see that here. European traders deemed the Negroes at Weta to be so civilized that it was a pleasure to do, to deal with them. Their greatest inconvenience was being exposed to the thievery of the common Negroes. The customs of the country allow polygamy to an excessive degree. The land was so cultivated that only footpaths were unplanted with grains. So this was a, a very vegetated place. Uh, yet the country was so populated and so much grain was sold to neighboring nations that it was often scarce before harvest. A barren year reduced free men to liberate their slaves and sell them or their families for want of sustenance. So they so grimy, bro. They, they're selling their family. Uh, I don't think this is something that Israelites do, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, what was that? The king was draped in gold and silver, and no one was ever to see him eat or drink from a glass or cup used by him. Let's keep going. None of the king's subjects daring to stand before him, regardless of rank. He was seemingly worshipped as he was seemingly worshiped as the common people raised him as an idol above the common functions and wants of human nature. So seemingly the king was revered, worshiped above uh, 
common functions and wants of nature. Basically, he was put above anything else that the common folk would want or need. He came first, the king. When they would salute him in the morning, they would prostrate themselves on the ground at the door of his house and kiss the earth three times, clapping their hands and whispering words of adoration for the king. This is, it sounds very African to me. This is an African custom. This is not an Asiatic custom. This is not a Judaic custom, a uh, Hebrew, whatever you want to call it. This is straight from Africa. This has nothing to do with anything Asiatic, Southwest Asia. They crawled on all fours in his presence while repeating the same reverence and remained prostrated on the earth until the monarch retired for the day. When the king would die, so would the order and honesty. As soon as his death was public, the people would steal their neighbor's property openly and not being liable to punishment. This system continued until the new king was crowned and was instantly stopped. So it was anarchy whenever the king died. Whenever it was known that the king died, the town went crazy. They just did whatever they want to do, stealing their neighbor's stuff, uh, open acts of violence etc but when the new king came in and implemented the rules they immediately stopped red was the color of the royal family and was forbidden to be worn by anyone else gambling was so common that when money and goods were little to none they would wager their wives children and their lands they gamble so hard that they would sell their own family, that they would gamble their own family and their land away if, if need be. If a man was to commit adultery with the wife of a rich man, not only would he be beheaded, but his whole family sold into slavery. Battles were won by way of large numbers alone, as the king could as the king could field over 200,000 men. So you see on the right, the door of no return. This is where a lot of our ancestors went through uh, to get onto the ships to never be seen again, at least in the old world. And they were brought to the new world. So this is a very emotional place, a place I actually want to visit one day soon. But um, yeah, it, I, I'm letting y'all, I'm not trying to get uh, share my opinion too much because I want y'all to make up your own mind on this. The name Wida is an anglicized form of Zwida. It was Judah to the French, a Judah to the Portuguese, and Fida to the Dutch. You have to pay close attention to that. Each, uh, each set of Europeans has a different way of pronouncing this this kingdom the name of this kingdom and that's for a reason the town was originally known as glaze layway or glehue uh if i said that right which i probably didn't which literally means farmhouse and this would attest to the uh um, the lush vegetation in the kingdom. The fine language can be transcribed most accurately as a phonetic script can be employed, which includes some letters additional to or with different values from the standard Latin alphabet. 
this script is not widely used in writing. However, con words and names being more commonly spelled in the standard Latin alphabet, thereby losing some of their distinctions made in the phonetic script. Very often, moreover, spelling follows French conventions, offering, for example, OU for you, DJ for J, C for K. So these letters and these vowels, depending on the language of the script that you use, can be changed and interchanged. That's a big reason why you see different pronunciations or different variations of the name of this kingdom for different uh, speakers of different languages. As an, illust as an il illustrative, uh, as an illustrative example, the name of the kingdom from which that of the town of Weida is derived may be written Zweda, X W E D A, in the phonetic script. Hueda, H U E D A, in the Latin alphabet, or Hueda. H O U E D A in the French spelling. So hopefully y'all y'all catching that. In a few cases, corrupt early forms of local toponyms have become sanctioned by usage and remain in general use today. Examples being the names of the kingdom of Dahomey and its capital Abomey, rather than the more strictly correct Dan Homey and Agbome. So that was an example of the corruptions being used as the standard now. I'll give the definition for franchise or Frenchify to alter in linguistic or literary form to approximate that the French language that of the French language. And it gives an uh, example, riding coat would be Frenchized to redignote, or however you said it. Linguistic anglicization, I had to say that slow. <laughs> Linguistic anglicization is the practice of modifying foreign words, names, and phrases in order to make them easier to spell, pronounce, or understand in English. The term commonly refers to the respelling of foreign words, often to a more drastic degree than that implied in, for example, romanization. One instance of the word dandelion modified from the French dent de lion or lion's tooth, a reference to the plant's sharply indented leaves. The term can also refer to a phonological adaptation without spelling change. Spaghetti, for example, is accepted in English with Italian spelling, but anglicized phonetically. So even though spaghetti, or the spelling of it at least, is Italian, the, the, the phonetics of how we say it in English is different. Like it's spelled the same, but we say it different. So we're going to get it to the map. This is the full version of the map that is used to make the claim in question. It is said to be made in 1747 by an English map engraver by the name of Emmanuel Bowen, who worked for George II of England and Louis XV of France as a geographer. These are two kings, George II and Louis XV. 
he worked, this English dude worked for an English king and a French king. Hence the anglicized and franchised linguistic modifications of Weda and Judah on the map. So I'm saying that you see uh, these anglicized and French Frenchified uh, terms or variations of Weda on this map because the map maker is an English dude who was making maps for an English king and a French king. And if that don't make sense, I don't know what will. The languages, the first inhabitants of the Weda kingdom were of the Fon linguistic group. It's a typo, it's supposed to be Fon. Fon is a part of the Eastern Bay Bay language cluster and belongs to the Volta Niger branch of the Niger Congo languages. Now I know that these phylums are uh, not proper to use anymore, but you know I, I'm not a linguist, so I'm doing the best I can. Fon is spoken mainly in Benin by approximately 1.7 million speakers. The Aja language is a Gbei language of the Niger Congo language, spoken by the Aja people, and it is closely related to other Gbei languages such as Ewe, Nina, Fan, and Flefera. Yoruba is a language spoken in West Africa. It is classified among the Idekiri, yeah, if I said that right, languages, and together with Itsekiri and the isolate Okala, form of the Yoruboid languages, form of the Yoruboid group of languages within the Volta Niger branch of the Niger Congo family. So I gave all them three languages because I wanted to show the languages that were in the area. You have the Aja languages. Um, you have the Europe, Yoruba language. So basically, it was basically just the Bay languages, GBE. That um, that language group, and you had uh, Yoruba. You have Niger Congo, Niger Volta. I, I don't see any Semitic languages anywhere in the area, no matter how hard I look. Now, if you can find a Semitic language in the kingdom of Weta at that time, then you can come back to me and I will uh, I will make corrections in public. I don't know if y'all will hear this video. Since y'all didn't hear the last video, I can try to play it. And um, y'all just let me know in the chat if y'all can hear it or not. If not, I'll, I'll turn it off and we can keep going. It's no big deal. He's saying the same thing that I've been saying. Is that it's no, they don't know anything about any Hebrew Israelites. No, nah, we can't hear. You will have to, uh, if you if you want us to hear what he's saying, you're going to have to take your screen at the top of your page and hit, uh, let me see here. Let me see. I'm trying to tell you what you can do. Is go to, at the top, there should be something that says more, or next to your microphone, there should be an arrow that says up. And then it'll ask you if you want to add computer audio on your screen at the top, if you hover over. Well, I'm sharing my whole screen, so I don't think it'll... Uh... Nah, it would have did it on your whole screen, sure. But 
where it says uh where it says your name at or you you doing it you see your name at the top yeah. Well, go on that. Just go on the presentation and turn the volume up. All right, let me see. Yeah, I don't think it's gonna play. It's all right, man. It's all good. Y'all can uh that's um yeah, I don't think it's gonna play. That's it's the brother right. um Damn, what is his name? It's playing right now. I heard some I heard it playing something, but it was low. Nah, that was the uh feedback from my um my phone, I got the I got uh I got the YouTube up on my phone. That was me talking. Okay, do you uh is this on your computer? Yeah, this on my tablet. Oh, okay. Yeah, but y'all can uh if, if y'all wanna watch that video, um I'll come back in the comments and leave a link for it. It's just uh the brother uh Dynas, Dynas the Mirror. He's in Weeda and he's uh with a uh, voodoo priest and he's asking them about eh, have they ever heard of Hebrew Israelites? Was the kingdom of Weeda ever a Hebrew Israelite uh kingdom? They they don't even know nothing about that. They they act the way they act is if they never even heard of no Hebrew Israelites. It's, it's, it's new to them. But voodoo has always been in Weida from the beginning of the kingdom. And they know nothing about Israelites being there. They never saw Israelites. They never were Israelites. But I'll leave that link for y'all so y'all can check that out. All right. So speaking of, we're getting to the religion. The people of Weta, in an almighty and omnipresent creator of the universe. Okay. The people of Weta believe in an almighty and omnipresent creator of the universe, but he was not an object of their worship. That's I'm, I'm gonna remind that because that's that's a major factor, and that's something that's very common in African systems. You will see that in most African systems, um, their supreme deity is not worshipped. He's not. Uh, you don't see no shrines for uh, Oladumare. You know what I mean? For example. So let me rewind that. The people of Weda believe in an almighty and omnipresent creator of the universe, but he was not an object of their worship, as they thought him too highly exalted above him to trouble themselves about the affairs of mankind. When they undertook any matter of importance, they committed its success to the first object that appeared on their going out of the house, a dog, a cat, or any other animal. The newly constituted deity would be given an offering with a vow that if proven successful, it would be revered. Otherwise, it was rejected and returned to its primitive estate. So basically, whenever they, um, Whenever they are going on a venture, a venture that's needed, uh, a venture where success is needed. Whenever they go out the house, the first thing they see is going to be 
the reason for their success if it's successful. So if the first thing they see when they come out of the house is a bird, for example, and whatever venture they're looking to do, they are successful in, they will attribute that success to that bird or whatever it is that they first see when they walk out of their house. That's just one aspect. The Republic of Benin is home to the Voodoo religion and their overwhelming majority Natives of Benin, despite past and current assault against Voodoo, have remained steadfast in their indefectible ancestral Voodoo religion. Voodoo and Benin make a natural combination and are inseparable. Voodoo is the word. Voodoo is the word in the Fang Bay language for spirit, and is used to denote African deities and ancestors and the worship of those deities and ancestors. The Fon call Voodoo by many names. The Voodoo pantheon is vast and includes many deities and divinities with varying importance. The world was created by Nana Bukulu and an androgynous supreme being. I'm gonna rewind that again. The world was created by Nana Bukulu, an androgynous male, male aspects and female aspects, an androgynous supreme being. From Nana Bukulu came the twins Mawu and Lisa. First on the list of primary deities in Dahomey, Voodoo Pantheon. So, Nana Bukulu is not uh, worship. He's the supreme being. Most supreme beings or supreme deities in Africa are not worshiped. So the first on the list is Mawu and Lisa. They are the top. Mawu and Lisa are responsible for the creations of the heaven and earth. Mawu the female principle corresponds to the moon and is associated with the night, fertility, motherhood, gentleness, and joy, all characteristics that one sees in women. The male principle, or excuse me, Lisa, the male principle corresponds to the sun and is associated with day, heat, strength, uh, I put heat again, war, power, toughness, and all things that char characterize a man. So these are what you would see worship. You wouldn't see uh, Yahweh. You wouldn't see uh, uh, Elohim. You wouldn't see Jehovah or Yahovah. You wouldn't see uh, Yahoo, none of that. You, you would see Mawu and Lisa. And they weren't even the Supreme. The Supreme was Nana Bukulu. So it's not it's not looking too good for this being an Israelite kingdom. The people of Weda had three public objects of devotion. Some lofty trees, which is the Baobab, Baobab tree, uh, the sea, and a certain sort of snake. Excuse me. The chief of these was the snake, Dangbe. The trees and the sea not interfering with his government, but being subject to his superintendence and reproof. The snake was invoked in all excesses of the seasons, in all difficulties of the state, in all dangers of the cattle, in all circumstances not committed to the previous mentioned deities of chance. So those deities of chance would be um, the, the dog or the cat or the bird or whatever they first see when they walk out of the house. Those would be the deities of chance that 
is referring to. But um, the snake, Dong Bei, the python, was their main thing. It was their it was their main thing. It was their main object of worship. And on the right, you see the crowning of the king of uh, or the king of Weta. This is done by Jacob Van Der. And seventeen from he this dude lived from seventeen fifteen to seventeen seventy nine. So this image was created somewhere in between that time. I couldn't get the exact date, but um, as you see on the top. Uh, it says Judah, J-U-I-D-A. And as you will see in the center of the picture, you will see uh, Dangbe, that python that they're talking about. You see all of Wida is crowded around this python. And this is what happens at the coronation of the king. Not, um, they ain't praising Yahweh, they ain't praising Elohim, they ain't praising Jehovah. They ain't. It's 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 Python. The sacred forest of Kapase or Kapase Zun uh, is the name of the forest. And Wida is dominated by huge ancient trees, accompanied by sculptures and wood carvings representing voodoo deities, also called loas. One large Iroko tree is said to be the site where King Pase, the founder of Wida, turned into a tree to escape his enemies. When Vudunsi, or devotees of Vudun, care for the sacred forest of, of Kapase, they understand that they are caring for their ancestors as the spirits of their ancestors are reincarnated into the Naga Iroko trees that the fawn called Loko. So their ancestors are reincarnated into these trees. That's why these trees are such an object of worship. When they have transitioned into mono trees, they will also require care and protection from their kin. So not Yahweh, not Elohim. They worship in trees over here. Shu or Zu or Agbe or Tovodun is the voodoo of the sea. This is the voodoo of the sea that they were speaking of. We did. We touched on the uh, python, uh, dying bay. We touched on uh, the the Iroko trees that uh, that their ancestors are coming back reincarnated as that they care for in the sacred forest. Now we're gonna get into the the sea voodoo. He was the third son of Maulisa or Sogbe or Sogbo. He had a female twin named Naete, who was also his wife. Maulisa is one is the one who told Agbe and Naete to inhabit the sea and command the waters. And I have an image of uh, Agbe. And his twin sister Naete on the on the right here. When asked about the origins of the universe, the typical fine person will refer to Nanabukulu, the deity who is the supreme being. Nanabukulu bore two children, Mawu and Lisa. According to the fine, after the goddess, after the after God created the universe. She moved, she removed herself from the dealings of men. Because of this, humans have to resort to appeasing lesser gods and goddesses for favors. Together, Mawu Lisa represents the pantheon of sky deities. Mawu, who is the moon, has female attributes and represents the element of coolness in the fine culture. 
we're just touching back over this again. Lisa, the sun, has male attributes and is symbolic of fiery elements. By collective name, the two deities represent a collective of lesser deities and uh, lesser gods and goddesses that make up the sky pantheon. According to Fon belief, Mawu was given the task of creating the world with the assistance of Legba, the trickster, and Ariwedo, the snake. All right, now I give my conclusion to everything that you see in this presentation. My conclusion to, is this uh, the kingdom of Weta, a an Israelite kingdom, was it inhabited by Israelites? Were uh, were is were Israelites the subject of the slave trade? Um, did Israelites have anything to do with Weta, or its kingdom, or its uh, trade? As one can see from the information previously disseminated from the slides, there seems to be absolutely no Hebraic influence on the culture of Weta, with a serious lack of cultural markers such as Hebrew language, foods, religion, and holy days such as Passover, Shabbat, Yom Kippur, and etc. Also, we fail to see Yah or Yahweh as Vudun has been a part of the landscape of modern day Benin, Togo region since times immemorial. Python worship was and still is prevalent. The, multi the multiple versions of names of this kingdom came from Europeans imposing their Ang anglicized and franchised forms of the name of the people onto the kingdom. The map. The maker of the map was a European Englishman that made maps for the King of Great Britain and the King of France, which is why we see franchised and anglicized forms of the name of the kingdom on, on the map. Furthermore, Weta was slave traders. Weta was slave traders, not slaves themselves, which would mean that Judah sold their own people, which is very rare in African culture. This is a prime and sad example of how our people will revise history to claim other cultures and deny their own. So that's my conclusion. Um, I went through the religion, I went through the everyday life, showed you how the people are, um, how they act, how they think. Uh, I showed you the uh, the customs. I showed you what they worship, who they worship, and how they worship. I showed you this map. I showed you who made the map. I showed you why it has different variations of uh, for this for the name of this uh, kingdom of Weta, I showed, um, man, I showed it all. So my conclusion is we see no Hebrew influence. We see no Semitic influence on this culture at all. We don't see any, we actually we see the opposite. We see African culture. We see them worshiping pythons. We see them, um, revering and worshiping lesser divinities rather than worshiping and revering the supreme deity, which wasn't even Yahweh in the first place. Um, something I want to add that I meant to put into the presentation is scarification. Now, if you look at these people, even today in Weda, they have certain scarification marks. These scarification marks line up with uh, marks from this specific python, which 
they refer to, you know, they, they worship as Dang Bay. This python has certain marks or coloration on his face. And the people of Wida use that as their scarification. I think it's like uh, five marks on each side. Either way, this is what they do. This is who they revere. They revere the snake. They even have scarification um, following the snake, the python. They don't. They don't. Um, they don't speak any Semitic languages. They don't have any Semitic uh, cultures or. or cultural practices or customs, um, except for maybe uh, circumcision, which I wouldn't call that a Semitic custom anyway. We first see it in Africa and it's all throughout Africa. So generally it's an African custom. So, I mean, if anybody out there can show me any Semitic influence any Hebrew Israelite influence on this kingdom, then I will gladly correct myself. But as of now, we don't see it. And I use not only secondary sources, a lot of this came from primary sources. So speaking of, here are my references. Quite a few of them I wanted to um, touch all bases when I was dealing with this presentation. Because I know they're just going to look at this and then, you know, keep back, go right back to saying what they were saying. But it's all good. Now y'all can uh, check out those sources, vet those sources, and you can get the information for yourself. So you can start correcting these people and teaching them the right way. And even if they don't want to listen, it's always other people that do that's around. So that's all I got for y'all, man. That's all I got for y'all. And uh, subscribe. I got to say subscribe to the to the Mice and subscribe to Cover Class ITV and subscribe to the Seth Shoe. Other than that, that's it for me. Hey, Sutek. What's up? Is there any connection to the country, uh, Weta, and the ship Weta? Yeah, the Weta um, Galley. The Weta yeah. Galley uh, was, uh, yeah. For the actually, audience. It was a, it was a, um, I didn't get into that too much, but I know it, it was a, it was a slave ship. Mm -hmm. right. um, I can't remember exactly where it wrecked that, but yeah, it, it that's exactly where they got their name from. The right. Rita Kelly slave ship is uh, comes the name comes from the kingdom of Rita. So yeah, wrecked and and found and they classified as the first found pirate ship, but it started off as you said um, as a slave ship. Right. And it was uh, just so everybody knows, and maybe we can do some further and get an investigation to see how that uh, the trade took place because you did have free people of African descent on that ship. Um, one that one name that I came across for certain, and I'll type it in the chat in case anybody wants it, is a man by the name of Hendrik Quintaire. Um, let me type that in there real quick but this goes along with the uh Cimarron stuff that i'm i'm working on yeah that'll be something that i have to uh, look into i i actually enjoy putting this presentation together and reading the primary man uh, i'm gonna have to uh get more into it i think i'm gonna do something uh on benin actually because this was on weeda but I learned a lot of stuff also about Benin the, uh, or Dahomey Kingdom. So 
Yeah, that might be coming soon. I, I might need to check out that with the galley ship too. Yeah, I haven't looked too much into this personally myself. Um, is there any truth to Weeder getting his name from the bird Weeder? It, it's ironic that you mentioned bird, and that was one of my notes that I had down. Well, um, yeah, some people say that. Um, I'm not sure. Some people say it's from. It comes from the bird. Though the name Weeder comes from the bird. It is the indigenous uh, name of the of the country for a bird mm -hmm. for a specific bird but um also it's been put forth that hueda h-u-e-d-a were the name of the people so it could have been it could have it could be either way it could it could go either way yeah i just like asking questions that might you know spark people's interest especially throwing out topics that kids can get involved in but good build let me see if sean, sean got anything to say or if the audience got any questions yeah, let me look in the chat one of the things i see sean typing stuff in there um one of the things about the leadership that they uh, put forth the argument that blacks was treated equally on it was once they found the remains of it, the way they found, uh, oh, I can't remember the jewelry that they found. I, I wanna say it was Madagascar. It was, it was some country from African uh, origins, jewelry and a form of currency, but it was divided equally amongst uh the ship crew and they have a listing of majority of the people on the ship and i want to say 30 plus of them were africans um, but i have to do some more research into that to really verify everything yeah I, that's something i have to um that's something i have to look into like i said I, i've heard i know i've heard about the the weed of galley but i've i've never really looked into it so that's something that I, I wouldn't I wouldn't even really talk about because I don't really know nothing about it like that. Yeah. But, well, yeah, I, I, I brought it, I honestly brought it up for, you know, a, a more underlining reason for all those that say, where are the slave ships? You know, I was kind of throwing that one out while we was on the topic of it, because this is one of them that they found. So. And then you got the, uh, the Henrietta Marie, you got the, uh, I can't think of the other one. I got a video actually on my page that um, that shows where a couple of these slave ships are. Yeah, where they found it, where they, uh, where they found them. I think one of them was like off the coast of, uh, uh, man, I don't wanna say, I gotta go back. But yeah, I got a, I got a video on my page that actually talking about that they showing um i don't know if it's the henrietta maria or the the other one but yeah man we got we got ships they in the they in the museum they in the museum they find them and they find they still finding more actually mm -hmm. yeah i'm trying to uh see can i find this scarification picture for y'all because I meant to put that in the presentation that was a big uh that was a big part of it okay let me see so The Weedle Pirate Museum is in um, is in Yarmouth, Massachusetts. It's thirty five dollars to get in there. If you want to go to the Weedle Pirate Museum, yeah, and then you can go into the Sacred Forest too, and you can go all up in there, man. If they feel like this is a 
Israelite kingdom out. I, I want to see one of them go over there. Show it. Show me your king. We got the brother Dynast over there. All up and through Whedon. Talking to everybody. Ain't nobody ever heard of them. Nobody heard of no Israelites. He going all through the sacred forest. He talking to the, the, the priests. Don't nobody know nothing about them, man. Nah, the people that are close to the area are converts claiming something because they have been converted. Anytime you hear anybody embellishing about that, it's all conversion, which is another thing that the, the Israelites do not confess to is uh, being converts. You know what I mean? Because once they admit that, they, you know, there was con a conversion took place, then that mean that that originally they wasn't them people. Right. People, I mean, you, I mean, you, converted anybody. To these, you converted to these beliefs because you were forced to convert because they were getting ready to ship your behind off to a new world. And you felt, and they told you that you could be spared and or saved or, you know, protected by this Jesus um, in that conversion. So pretty much this missionary work went hand in hand with the enslaved, which also cost you behind twice, spiritually and physically. Yeah, you profess to be these people that you're not, which goes back to the show that was on the Dagger Squad earlier today with the information that led up until the whole first hour and some change or whatever. You know, shit, Jesus didn't even save him because you can look at the, the Congo, the kingdom of the Congo. They turned Christian, and we see it didn't save them. They were still, them Europeans were still over there snatching up people. Damn, this snatched up everybody, damn, everybody in the kingdom to the point where the king had to write a letter telling them, hey, man, I don't, this, this, ain't, this can't be happening. We converted. We did what you said. Y'all still snatching up my people. What's going on? Yeah. So Jesus didn't even say. Yeah. At the end of the day, because really, that's really why some of them even converted. They converted for not only for trade, but also, you know, because part of doing trade with them folks is that you had to, you had to be in position to actually communicate with what they had going on, and they wouldn't trading with you if they felt like you were a heathen so to say, as they would proclaim people to be who do not follow the the, uh, the Abrahamic faith. So in that conversion, which allowed you to be, it allowed you to be able to trade, similar to what they did over here with the Africans, the early Africans by separating them, uh, you know, the way that they actually did and giving more prowess to a preacher than they did to uh, just a regular lay, uh, lay African that was over here that was enslaved. The preacher had more ability to move around because they were they was spitting that that craziness. And if you look at the early the the early history of Christianity in the Americas when dealing with the with the, the historical makeup of the the African, look at all the people that actually took off under. This is why I charge Danny when he get to talking about them early Christians these people that were converting, that were pastors and all of that, they were the first ones to not only, but they took advantage of the situation, but they were the first ones to get to Sierra Leone and Liberia to do what? Establish themselves and continue to basically do missionary work, uh, you know, for the, Euro the, the European, uh, the, the colonizer, and helping them orchestrate and broker the, the things that need to be brokered to get to the interior of Africa. So, you know, it's one thing to praise these early Christians for the uh, the, the Africans, uh, African-American Christians who, who did, who created all of these things, trying to look for solutions to problems. But it's another thing when um, on the flip side of it, they look like missionaries when they came back to Africa. That's why I did that the uh, birth of Liberia from a West African perspective presentation, because it specifically states from the people themselves that they looked at the, the African-American as such, Black missionaries. 
Yeah, I was was about to ask you before you said Liberia, if you was talking uh, the early Christians as far as coming over with the Portuguese and Spanish or if you met in the United States uh, region. Because you can see similar things take place there, but what's inter- interesting about what happened in South America is they put a ban on those who had familiarity with Christianity but it was more or less they was writing so many appeals about what was happening that they started seeking out what they called the Bozal uh, Africans, meaning they was taking them without any kind of Spanish or Portuguese influence on them at all. So, yeah, it, it's a very, very tangled and, and messed up history, and we need to be able to sort it out properly. I, I agree with you, Sean. Y'all got anything else? Nah, man. Nah, man. I don't see if anybody... I don't see nothing in the chat. Yeah, ain't nothing in the chat. Well, on that note, man, we'll go ahead and end the show. I want to say Shimmer Motel. Depart in peace. Catch y'all next week when the next show is up. Peace. Peace out.